Hello, welcome back to PlayStation Access. My name's Nathan, and welcome back to the Tuesday Checklist. Every week, we take inspiration from a recent or upcoming release to spark a conversation about some of our favourite games. With the recent Dynasty Warriors 9 satisfying our hunger for killing entire armies with multiple presses of square, we got to thinking about our video game guilty pleasures. First up to bat, it's Holly. Uh, so my gaming guilty pleasure is actually a series of games, uh, and it is the Dynasty Warriors series. Right. Unsurprisingly, because that's what this video is about. How many of them are there now, Holly? <laughs> there are, if you don't include the spin-offs, for mm. which there are loads, there are nine, but I believe there is some discrepancy in the numbering from where they were released, because obviously it's a Japanese thing. Samurai Warriors and things like Yes. Gundam? Yes. There's a, there's a lot of them, basically. Yeah. But specifically for me, it has always been the Dynasty Warriors series. Um, bit like FIFA, they're kind of all the same. But they're not, <gasps> but they are. But they're not, but they are. Right. Because they have to be. <laughs> <laughs> so they're all based off a really famous 14th century Chinese novel called Romance of the Three Kingdoms, mm -hmm. which is a historical look at the battle for supremacy in China. It's about, covers about 100 years. So obviously it takes those characters, those battles, and then obviously the game then, you know, has a little a bit, bit of flair, yeah, to make it really fun. But basically it always has to follow the romance of the three kingdoms. They're all based on the same story. Yeah. So it's like a remake. Yeah, like FIFA, they're all based on FIFA. Against football yeah, yeah. It. yeah it, exactly. So there's always the Yellow Tur Turban Rebellion, there's always where you meet Lu Bu, Diao Chan is in there, even though she didn't have a name in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. I didn't know that. Yeah, they, they literally always start with like the Yellow Turban Rebellion. They have always started with this. Wow. Gameplay is just so satisfying. Because <laughs> you can like whack it down on easy and it's just basically run into like hordes of people. And one thing the Dynasty Warriors series has always done is Oh, you can have a hundred enemies on screen at once. Five hundred enemies on screen at once, and you basically chuck it on easy, like run away from you the rest of your army and just run straight into the biggest pile of people you can find and just let off a special attack. It's so <laughs> satisfying. See, this is a guilty pleasure on the grounds that I remember when I first got into the industry uh, fourteen years ago. Wow, no. They were reviewing a copy of. Uh, Dynasty Warriors. Which one? Do you would, remember? No, they were already <laughs> making jokes about how it was the same as all the other ones, and how would they like, you know, present it in the magazine? So, it, and that was forty. And the joke is now, here we are with Dynasty Warriors Nine. Now that has tried something new. Horses? No, we already had. Horses. We already had horses. Open world. Mm. So they're trying out sort of this open world mechanic. Before you sort of just you had, you just sort of jumped from battle to battle and then that was sort of, sort of interconnected by the story and which characters you picked because there's way there's different there's three different kingdoms obviously Wei, Shu and Wu and then depending on who you picked depends on how the story plays out okay because obviously you see it from their point of view you can kind of screw with history a little bit as well but yeah it's kind of well, what is there to do in Dynasty Warriors if you're not just smashing why, X just killing or, 50 people at a time why would you do anything else. I don't know, you said it's open world, so I'm assuming there's a bit in between. Oh, battles. so now there's like side quests you can do, you can go off and you can gather stuff. It's like crafting as well, you can craft potions. <laughs> yeah, it, there's a little bit more to it, but honestly, the, the guilty pleasure of it all is running mindlessly into hordes of people and hacking and slashing your way through all of the daily stress that you've had from your working week. Okay, my guilty pleasure game. I was going to say Pez because I just play Pez all the time. <laughs> then I figured Pez is brilliant, so it's not really a guilty pleasure, is it? It's just mate. playing a brilliant game. No. Um, so my guilty pleasure, I don't play it so much now, but when I was younger I used to play this all the time in favour of definitely better games, mm. was uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. No the way. game, which I got one Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I still think it's quite good. I honestly do. Like, it's unlicensed to hell. Like, really quite off versions of all the actors who were in the movies, like uh, Albus Dumbledore. This is when Richard Harris was still playing Albus Dumbledore. There's a really bad Richard Harris lookalike that comes on, and then an awful actor just doing these lines. And like, uh, McGonagall's in there, terrible. Hagrid's <laughs> in it. Awful. <laughs> Just, <laughs> and he's got like PS1 era yeah, polygonal lightning yeah. space. And there are, it's in that weird era of games where games didn't really know whether they should have been still pixely and 
uh, like arty or stylized, or whether they should be going for realism. Yeah. And there's that awkward kind of, oh, and everyone kind of looks like like a, oh, and they've got like a, they've got like a, they've got like a pasted photo face on the top of just a bunch of polygons that's <laughs> waving around. They always look like that enemy from Men in Black. The guy who wears someone else's skin. Oh, oh yeah. And he's always yeah. just sort of walking around like someone's literally stuck his it's face on. It's not better. That <laughs> yeah. one. Um, that was but, accurate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're a wizard, Harry. But this, I mean, I don't think they quite fully understood what Harry Potter fans wanted. Um, I still liked it anyway, for some reason. <laughs> but they just filled this game with loads of nonsense that wasn't in the movies or the books. Um, so, for instance, there was a, a mini game where you could control a minecart going through Gringotts Bank, you know, the, the cool roller coaster things. Yeah. But you'd have to, like, dodge obstacles and collect coins and collect diamonds. <laughs> and there's a goblin, like, oh, that's very good. Never seen anyone handle a minecart like that, Mr. Potter. You win a gold galleon. <laughs> 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 like and then you get Quidditch, which was. You'd think that would be exciting, wouldn't you? But you played Harry as the seeker and you had to follow the snitch and the snitch would let off these rings that you had to fly through to like what? chase it down. So you know like the horrible flying tutorials in all games that have flying in them where you yeah. just have to fly through rings and it's always the hardest thing ever and you hate it. That was Quidditch. They made Quidditch that and you had to collect Bertie Bott's every flavour beans. I think I you, had to, you had to collect earwax flavour beans for the Weasley twins and in exchange they would give you passwords to portraits that would allow you to access new areas. I remember an awful boss battle against Draco Malfoy and Crab and Goyle where it was just them throwing crackers at you. <laughs> there were no spells involved, it was just like, have a cracker. And you had to pick up the crackers and throw them back at Draco Malfoy. And there was a race against Peeves, you know, Peeves the ghost who they cut from the movies entirely. Yeah. He's made a little race for you, sort of like the Riddler's challenge from Batman Arkham. Wow. So what was, the, what was the draw? I think that it was just Harry Potter. I just really liked it. There was. I really liked exploring the castle because it was quite open. It wasn't for a PS1 game as well, where open worlds hadn't really caught on at that point, and technically they weren't very impressive, but the castle was mostly open from the beginning. You could go all around the castle. You could go into the grounds. You could go into Hagrid's ground and the Forbidden Forest. And for a long time, my dream game has been, will someone just make an open world Hogwarts game? It doesn't have to be set in the Harry Potter story. You could be like, it could be like, you know, 50 years in the future and I'm a student and you get sorted into your own house and you learn spells and you do all the lessons and you go to Hogsmeade and... I want this. I think I want it'd this be game. an amazing game. It would be such an amazing game if someone would just make that. And that's always a, a thing I've wanted. And Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone did not give me that. <laughs> but <laughs> it was the closest thing I had. And... For all its faults, I just kept on playing it again and again. It was just, I mean, I'm a sucker for Harry Potter. I loved being in that world, and that was really the only game that let me get anywhere close to it. Okay, my guilty pleasure. Um, so I was, there, there are kind of a few seven out of 10 games I considered, you know, uh, what I would consider to be like seven out of 10 games. Stuff like Dying Light, I put an incredible amount of time in, but. I think Dying Light, you know, it's got a huge amount of fans. It's basically a really good game. So I thought about a, a game which I'd be actually embarrassed to tell people how, how much I played. And the answer is Zuma's Revenge on PlayStation 3. I don't even know what that what? is. What's that? I could tell you what it is. Zuma's Revenge is a game where you play a giant frog statue in the middle of the screen in Aztec ruins and you fire stone balls at a series of balls which are snaking around the outside of the screen. It's a bit like, if you imagine a slightly graphicked up version of Beehive Bedlam on the Sky menu. Oh, I yeah. loved Beehive Bedlam. There we go. Well, Zuma is a lot like that, except it's got weird sound effects and kind of Aztec chanting. And every time you spit a ball, it like hits. So like these, they're snaking around, there's like a predetermined track of different colour balls that are going around the screen. Sometimes they like double up, so there's like two layers of them, and they march basically towards the end, and if they get to the end, you've lost. So you've got to colour match them with the ones that your frog is vomiting, um, and then you, you have to aim and spit them out and get them into line at the right point, so they colour match and they disappear. Some of the other balls have got like slow down, some of them actually speed up, um, some of them reverse it for a little bit, which really, really helps you. Sometimes you get like a cannon ball, which kind of smashes through and destroys whatever it is. And the, it comes down to a lot like uh, Beehive Bedlam, um, just having to fire the balls with accuracy, with planning, 
and against the clock. It's a, it's a, and it's one of them games where, like, I think because I'm a stubborn idiot, like, if I, uh, there's something about this game, once I started losing, I was like, no, no, I'm not gonna, um, this isn't gonna happen. And I would finish levels with, like, you realise you haven't blinked for, like, 10 minutes and your eyes are, like, stuck open and dry. Um, but my little frog guy would be, would be winning. Oh, it's an amazing game, Who's honestly. Zuma? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if uh, I think it may be like an old mobile version. It was called Montezuma, and it might be the place. But so the place is getting revenge on the frog. I well, <laughs> that's a really good question. I've never thought about it like that, Rob. I think I'm so centered on being the frog right. that I've never really considered the wider philosophical, you know, implications of See. everything that's going on. But it's inc it's an incredible. I want to tell you about the sound effect, really specifically, the sound effect when you spit a ball as this frog and it knocks into the other balls. It's got the most satisfying rock on rock sound effect. <laughs> it's amazing. And he, sometimes you get a precision shot and it gives you, it makes your like uh, targeting triangle slightly longer and you can put the ball exactly where you want it to make sure that you knock it between the right two balls and then it goes even faster. Mm, that noise is, is, is right up there. It's amazing. So and then enjoying it on like an animal level here. And then once you win, and all the balls just kind of swirl down a kind of a drain, and you get like a Crash Bandicoot style, maybe racist nowadays bit of like chanting, like blah, 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 and you're like, <laughs> yeah, on to the next level. Let's go. So my guilty pleasure is going to make some people angry. Oh, oh. no. It's Assassin's Creed 3. <laughs> Three. <laughs> now that is what the sound. What do you like about that, that game? Yeah. That is the sound of, that a man who likes Assassin's Creed Three hears all the time. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird one, isn't it? Because, like Assassin's Creed One, fine. Assassin's Creed Two, fine. Four, fine. Be my friend. You know, even the later ones, Syndicate, Unity, great. Let's hang out. Origins, Origins yeah. amazing, great game. Three. Hmm. <laughs> What's wrong with you? What? Why do you like three? Why three? So there's, there's two reasons to this. The first reason is that despite my youthful looks, I am old enough to have been around <laughs> since the first Assassin's Creed came out. So I was there at the beginning and I was there for two. I was there for Brotherhood. I was there for Revelations and I was there for three. So when three came out, I was ready for it. I'd really enjoyed the previous <laughs> four games. Three, the same boat. three came out. Yeah, I was the same. It's like you were training. Three, yes, exactly. I was training for it and I was ready and three came out and I absorbed it and I was really excited about it. And I really like playing it, you know. Despite Desmond being not the best character in gaming history, I'd spent a hundred hours with him and his Abstergo DNA counterparts. So I wanted to finish that story. I enjoyed Desmond's story. I like Desmond. What, what else is going on in Assassin's Creed 3 as someone who's not really ever paid much? The second, I'll come on to it, the second part of it is the setting. So, my two great loves are video games and history. So, Assassin's <laughs> Creed is the perfect meeting point of those two things. And when you set a game in colonial America, I'm all in, whatever the cost. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, like, how shanky the menu system is, or how hollow the characters are. I'm going to be there anyway. The, the world that it made was just a really nice place for me to beautiful. be. I remember it was beautiful. Is this uh, one where you, where you were Connor? Yeah. You yes. were Connor. You started off as Haytham, which was a great that. start, because he was a great character. That start was amazing. And maybe the, the point I'm trying to make is that I was too far in. You know, because you play as Haytham for maybe the first like four or five hours, and there's no, there's no way back from that, really. I couldn't drop them. I finished all the Assassin's Creed games. I wasn't going to let that one stop me. And I've got past that point now and have continued to complete all the other Assassin's Creed games past that. And I'm ploughing through Origins as we speak. Origins is great. Yeah. So, you're a so it's three. <laughs> <laughs> so you, got, you, got, you used to live in the shadow, shadow as people, as people accused you of being, being an Assassin's Creed 3 like liker. That is, that is correct, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't talk about it often <laughs> enough, really. I'll lose too many, many followers. Do you know what I think? Um, what you said about Quidditch is quite um, illustrative, isn't it? Because Quidditch is a rubbish idea, and I, like everyone <laughs> really takes it to heart. And people do like real life Quidditch, and I really like Harry Potter, and I hate those people because it's a terrible game, and they should just get over it. And the idea that like even in a video game, 
you can't because if you're Harry Potter, you're just waiting for the end of the game. Then you've got to catch one magical ball. That's rubbish. So that's why they had to make. You it do so have blood just flying at you. Well, and I the commentator's like, "It's a bludger." <laughs> 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 and you have right. to dodge the bludger while you're chasing the snitch. But yeah, it's like just. Is there a standalone Quidditch game? On PS2? No, I don't two. think so. I don't think so. No, no I meant... No. Wasn't there right. Quidditch World Cup or something? Right. No, I think there was Quidditch World was Cup. Was there? Unless this is just like... Uh, am I getting like Mandela Syndrome up? or something? Yeah. And I'm just remembering an alternate history <laughs> these that are all exist. The, these are all the things you want that never existed. Yeah. Quidditch World Cup. Yeah. PS2. Yeah, exactly. I wow. did... Uh, my memory is right. What I must have, rubbish idea I must have just blocked that one from my memory. It's it's such a but it is like you know a game of football where you can score thirty goals and still lose because someone <laughs> finds just a magic bean on the pitch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I thought the snitch was worth a certain amount of points. Yeah, one hundred and fifty. Yeah, so if you score one hundred and sixty, but then you're not going to catch the snitch, are you? Because then you end the game and yeah, but, although, so, but if I get one hundred and sixty points and mm-hmm. you catch the snitch and you haven't scored any points, yeah, then I'd the person who, the person who catches the snitch has lost the game. That's what happens in Goblet of Fire when Victor Crumb catches it. Like, his team are getting thrashed, like, 312, I don't know the exact score. But I guess he's not looking, is he? Because he's so focused, that's the idea, is they're so focused on the snitch. I think they explained it away with uh, Crumb knew they were going to lose. He just wanted to end the game on his own terms. Oh, shut up, Crumb. <laughs> <laughs> Quidditch is the worst bit of Harry Potter. Sorry. You're so bitter. After you write, I know, I've always hated it, I'm sorry. It's so bitter. I still, I think it's quite exciting. I like it, yeah. I'd watch a game. I'm not dead inside, Nave. You bloody know. It's a stupid game with stupid rules, okay? No, I don't have a recurring nightmare involving Hagrid and a quaffle. Shut up. Anyway, thanks for watching. Let us know about your gaming guilty pleasures in the comments. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it. And join us again next week for another Tuesday Checklist.